we can get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Thank you for joining us for this fifth in our series of injury seminars hosted by the Georgia Institute and the University of New South Wales. My name is Margie Peden, um, and I will be introducing um, the topic uh, under discussion today. My colleague, Rebecca Ivers, uh, will be chairing the questions. Um, um, Please feel free to pop questions as the presentations are being done in the Q&A um, or in the chat as you feel um, as, as they come up. So very exciting today that we uh, have a discussion about the new decade um, of action for road safety. I'm sure many of you are aware that WHO um, and the UN Road Safety Collaboration launched a new second decade of action at the end of last month. Um, and we're very honored to have Dr. Nan Tran with us, who is the head um, of the, the Safety and Mobility Unit at WHO to tell us about that plan. He will be followed um, by three of our colleagues who are implementing projects as part of a Botner Child Road Safety Challenge, which is um, led by the Global Road Safety Partnership. We thought it would be useful to hear about the plan and what's in the new plan, and then perhaps have some examples of how that plan already um, is being implemented in countries um, around some of the new issues um, that the plan highlights. So without any more ado, I'm going to ask Nan if you, Nan, would share your screen um, and give us an overview of the, of the plan. We look forward to it. Great. Thanks a lot, Margie. And I hope by now everybody can see my screen. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump into the presentation. As Margie has already said, at the end of 2020, we marked the end of the first decade of action for road safety. And as many of you recall, there was a ministerial conference in Stockholm, Sweden in February of 2020 uh, to commemorate uh, basically the end of the decade, but also to start thinking about the new decade and to apply to start discussing what are the key lessons that we've learned. Uh, following that, um, I'm is my slide, oh, there you go. Uh, following that, uh, in August of 2020, there was a United Nations General Assembly resolution that proclaimed the, the decade 2021 to 2030 as the second decade of action for road safety. And along with that, it reaffirmed the target of a 50% reduction in the number of deaths and serious injuries by the year 2030. It also called upon the WHO along with the UN regional commissions and the UN Road Safety Collaboration to prepare a plan of action to guide member states to achieve that uh, goal of a 50% reduction. You don't have to uh, uh, look so closely at this slide, it's just to give you an idea of the process that was undertaken in order to develop this plan. Namely to say that it was, it was a really consultative process. We had uh, engagement uh, with a number of stakeholders as well as member states. We actually had a member state uh, briefing and we had a period whereby we actually allowed member states and other global, stake global stakeholders to provide input. Finally, just to note that in October of 2021, just last month, we actually formally launched the global plan uh, in an event which drew over 2000 participants virtually. But that actually marks just one part of this process. It's actually the start. And you'll see here that the slide actually uh, continues. Uh, we also know that in June, uh, June 30th and July 1st of 2022, uh, there will be a high level meeting on road safety at the UN General Assembly in New York. This meeting is intended uh, to target heads of states, so prime ministers and presidents uh, and other senior ministers. And the idea is to really look at the implementation of the global plan. So what we've learned is that it's important to actually have a plan, but it's equally important to place emphasis and ensure that there is actually a commitment towards the implementation of this plan. And that's why it's so great to see that some countries are already doing this. Um, um, uh, uh, that, that, that you'll hear about. So as I said, the plan is really uh, meant to guide countries towards this attainment of the 50% reduction. And it's meant to be an inspiration. It's not meant to be taken literally, but we also recognize the importance of the need to tailor and adapt certain strategies to different contexts. What is appropriate in Vietnam may be different than what is appropriate in Uganda or in Cameroon and other countries. And so this is part of the, uh, the lessons that we've learned. 
quickly just to emphasize the fact that this plan really emphasizes and builds upon the principles of a safe system. And it really calls upon countries to really think about transport and mobility systems that are responsive to the needs of its users. So the idea being that obviously it's important to think about safety, but the safety is directly linked to how people use their uh, transport and mobility. And so the idea is that systems should be forgiving of human errors and also respond to the needs of how people choose to use. Uh, we emphasize in this plan the importance of road safety as a shared responsibility. And you'll see shortly that we actually take time in the plan to actually highlight the roles that different actors within society play. And finally, the, the, the plan really is based on the notion that transport and mobility are evolving processes and they're not static. And in the way that we think about safety, we need to think about safety as not only a one-time intervention, but as an evolving process. So in the last two years, we've seen as a result of the COVID pandemic, mobility and transport patterns actually change. People are not moving about as much and that changes the way we ought to think about safety. And so as we think about technology and other things in the coming decade that will change mobility systems, we also need to think about how do we adapt our approaches to ensuring the safety of these systems. So the plan basically has five key elements and they're shown here. The first is basically the vision of the plan, which as I said, really draws upon the principles of a safe system. We then talk about the recommended actions, five areas of actions. We then specifically identify some key factors that are critical for the implementation of the plan. We talk about the importance of shared responsibility and the roles that different actors within society play and their contributions. And then we talk about the importance of monitoring and evaluation. As with the previous decade, WHO has been requested by the UN General Assembly to monitor progress by member states towards the achievement of a 50% reduction by the year 2030. And to that end, WHO will be producing in 2023 its next global status report on road safety. And this report will reflect data from 2021 and will serve essentially as the baseline for this decade. So we will be starting this process in 2022 and we will once again be collecting data from member states and reporting on that data in 2023. So in terms of the recommended actions, this is what we have described as the what. Basically, the plan has three parts. It talks really about what to do, it talks about how to do it, and it talks about who should do it. And in terms of the what, we, we have re, re retained many of the same elements that were emphasized in the last decade, namely safe road infrastructure. We talk about safe vehicles. We talk about the importance of safe road use, as well as the importance of a post-crash response. Here, however, we've added a fifth element, and this is an element that focuses on multimodal transport and land use planning. And the reason for this is because we recognize that in many societies that achieving improvements in road safety will require a change in the modal split in terms of the transport modes that are being used by the population. In some instances, it will mean moving away from car-based societies to societies that actually rely more heavily on public transport and enable safer walking and cycling, which are not only healthier, but also uh, better for the environment. And here we make an explicit link to the sustainable development agenda, recognizing that there are opportunities for us to link road safety as an issue of concern to the broader SDGs, including things such as climate change, things as urban health, as well as things related, uh, goals related to gender and equity and access. So this is why we really emphasize the fact that actually thinking about road safety will require us to also think about the modal split and how we optimize that modal split in order to achieve the optimal performance and safety of a transport system. As I said, we've also really made an explicit point to talk about the need that not only is it important to know what to do, we also actually have to put in place things that are required to ensure effective implementation. And here you see the seven elements that have been described, and I won't go into detail, but I will highlight a couple of them. Obviously, financing is a major element uh, that, that that is critical uh, to ensuring the implementation of the plan. We know from history that a lot of countries have actually developed well-developed, well-articulated plans and targets, but they remain unfunded. So part of the call for the minister at the high-level meeting in 2022 is to ensure that government not only commit 
to the plan and to developing their own plans, but also to ensure that financing is there. Of course, there are other issues, including, for example, the importance of building capacity, ensuring appropriate gender perspectives, uh, perspectives, ensuring a focus also on low and middle income countries, as well as being able to monitor and adapt to technologies. We also emphasize the last part of the plan is really about who should do this. And again, this builds on the principle of a shared responsibility within the safe system. And it calls upon governments as well as other actors. And here I take a, a moment just to emphasize the importance, for example, of civil society, youth, and academia. Obviously, this community of researcher plays an important role in generating the evidence. And I would emphasize even more that in this decade, we really do need more evidence and more implementation research to guide implementation on the ground and to overcome many of the challenges that we experienced in the last decade. We call also specifically on the engagement and active participation of the private sector to, to contribute to own up up to their own responsibility is not only as financiers or providing funding, but also to ensure throughout their value chain that they ensure road safety. So the idea here is that we really do want this to be a blueprint, but as I said, a blueprint that is appropriately tailored and adapted to local cities, uh, local uh, contacts, local uh, needs, and, and local priorities. We want every country and every city to actually have their own plan. We want these plans to identify targets. We want them to also identify the roles and responsibilities of appropriate actors. And most importantly, we want to ensure that these plans are not just plans, but they actually are supported by financing as well as reporting mechanisms to ensure that there is an opportunity to hold various actors within the society accountable for their actions. So this in a nutshell represents a very brief overview of the plan and what we hope to do with it. And as I said at the start, this is only a starting point for us. And we really do rely on partners around the world to really take this forward and reach to engage with local governments and local actors to ensure its implementation and to ensure that we do succeed this time around at achieving the 50% reduction in the number of deaths and injuries. Thanks. Over back to you, Margie. Thanks, Sam, for a, um, a, a great overview. And I, and I really like the simplicity um, of your slides, I must say. It gets across the, the points really well. Rebecca, I'm not sure, are there any questions directly to Fornan? No, I can't see any questions at the moment. Um, but Nan, I've, I've got a question for you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, I, of course, I'm very supportive of the multimodal shift and very, you know, strongly advocated for that. I think, as you know, um, do you think it's gone? Do you think we've gone far enough um, with that and, and with the support that we're providing for countries to actually really uh, enable uh, uh, the modal shift that we know is so essential to change? Uh, so, um, good question, Rebecca. I mean, this was a surprisingly, uh, uh, actually quite a, a, a heavily debated issue within the, the, the road safety community because there are uh, those in the community that see this as beyond what road safety should address. Um, so I think that it's, it, it was an important achievement to actually have it included in the global plan. Uh, do I think personally think that we could go further? Yes. Uh, but I also think that the real message here is the opportunities to link road safety to the broader sustainable development agenda. There is already efforts taking place going on. COP26, we've heard last week and a half ago, a week and a half ago, whatever it was, um, lots of discussions about urban settings, transport being a big contributor to, uh, to, to climate change. And so I think that it's not as important you know, we don't really have to repeat what's already been said and to redo what's already there. I think the challenge for the road safety community is to link to those existing efforts and to create a narrative. And as I often tell people, from my perspective, it really doesn't matter whether a city is making changes and, and really discouraging car driven uh, transport systems because they want uh, it, it, for, for the reasons of climate change, we know that it also results in, in, in improvements in road safety. So whether they do it for safety or whether they do it for climate change, I'm happy with it. And I think that's really the, 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 the approach that we should be. It's about really leveraging what's already happening and leveraging and building on those co-benefits. Right, thanks so much. And I completely agree. Uh, so, Maggie, I think we might start with the next presentation now. Well, if anyone else has got questions, we'll hold them over to the end now. Thanks very much, Nan. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. I, I'm having some tech issues here. So I think that Anna may 
project from from her side. My computer screen has has frozen. I hope you are still hearing me. Um, okay, so so thank you, Nan. Um, I see there was one other question about um, how the plan actually addresses the issue of COVID or, or um, you know based on uh, the the reduction in in travel during COVID and the boom that we're seeing um, of travel after COVID. But maybe we'll keep that to the to the end, and you can you can think so long. So. Um, we're going to be having three short presentations now. The first one will be by Chu from um, Plan International um, in Vietnam. She's been working on the Safest Cities for Girls program in Hanoi uh, since 2014 and has 17 years of experience working with Plan on various projects related to child protection and gender-based violence. She's going to be telling us about um, a project that they have implemented as part of the Botner, um, Road, uh, Botner Child Road Safety Challenge um, around um, a gendered approach to road safety in Vietnam. To, over to you. Oh, you're muted. Um... Thanks, Maji. Can you help share my presentation? Sorry, too. We'll just pull it up in about 30 seconds. It's just loading up. Yep, yep. Uh, so, good afternoon from Vietnam. My name is Tu. I'm the project coordinator for the Plan International Vietnam. Yes, I'm very happy to be here with you today and share with you a quick overview about the gender transformative work that we at Plan International are implementing across the globe to ensure rural safety in the cities. Uh, yes, uh, in the recently launched global plan for the decade of action for road safety 2020 to 2030, gender is clearly mentioned as one of the crucial factors to consider to reduce road traffic deaths and injuries. But what does this mean? I would like to illustrate this with a practical example, the safety of girls on buses. Yeah, in many cities in Vietnam, bus is the popular means of public transportation for all people, especially for girls and young women. And it is cheap and safe. It is also considered safer than motorbikes, which is very popular in Vietnam in terms of accidents or injuries. However, if passengers, particularly girls, do not feel safe when using them to get to school, because they fear of sexual harassment, they will, they will use private transportation instead. We can cause accidents for them or cause traffic jam in the cities. Uh, and, and the feeling unsafe when traveling by public transportation can also prevent girls and young women from going outside and participate into social activities. And thus we will hinder their opportunities to learn and to develop their full potentials. Uh, therefore, to prevent injuries and to create equal opportunities for girls to participate, we should make public transportation safer for them. Bus safety for girls is one of the aspects that we consider in our child, child road safety project implemented in Taiwan within the framework of the Botner Child Road Safety Challenge. However, Safer Cities for Girls program goes beyond just safe public transportation for girls. Yes, next slide, please. Uh, safer, the Safer Cities for Girls Global Program was developed together with UN Habitat and Women in the Cities International. The program strives to build safe, accountable, and inclusive cities with and for girls in all of their diversity. It is a groundbreaking initiative that seeks to close existing gaps between the urban programming, targeting either youth or women by focusing on adolescent girls who are often the most vulnerable vulnerable and excluded population in the cities. Other program works to achieve the three outcomes, increase girls' safety and access to public spaces, increase girls' active and meaningful participation in urban development and governance, and increase girls' autonomous mobility in the city. Currently, the program is being, is being implemented in 19 cities in the world in all five continents where PLAN is working. Yes, next slide, please. 
Uh, so uh, Hanoi, uh, even among the first cities that implemented the project since the beginning in the 2014. So far, the project has gone through four phases in which we have been working with different level of partners and stakeholders. Uh, for, the, for the Paris 14 to 2016, it's a piloting pro phase when we pilot just some activities with the transportation sectors in Hanoi and with boys and girls. For the Paris 16 to 18, we started to fully implement the program in all three outcomes when we work with partners from local to national level. For the Paris 18 to 20, we promote a cities and national wide approach in which we managed to advocate for a safer city for girls and women model to wider range in Vietnam. And currently for the Paris 20 to 23, we are trying to strengthen the model and work with local NGO and government partners to sustain the model and to advocate for changes in policies and in programs. Next slide, please. And our project's key interventions include uh, we work with girls and boys so that to, they will be the, become the champion of change for gender equalities and gun rights through activities such as capacity building for girls and boys, regular club meetings, girl-led communication campaign, and youth-led survey and policy dialogue. We sensitize partners, uh, we sensitize parents, caregivers, and public audience about safety issues that girls may face in public places and change, try to change social norms that are affecting safety issues of girls through creative forms of communication in school, in the community, inter, intergenerational dialogue to core efforts for, to make city and the community safer and inclusive for girls. We also work with transportation sector to promote girls' safety on buses through training for transit staff, bus drivers on gender equality and gender-based violence issues. We conduct surveys in bus stops to identify unsafe issues and report back to the transportation sector for improvement. We work with them to develop the code of conduct on buses for transit staff and also for passengers. We also try to engage government partners and influence policies through training for government staff on safety for growing model policy dialogue to advocate for changes to tackle safety issues of girls in public places. Yes, next slide, please. And after six years of implementation, we have achieved some results as follow. We have set up a network of 1,500 girls and boys who are champion of change and are taking very active participation and the leading role in the city governance. And the safer cities for girls intervention and tools have been included in a guidebook to build safe and safe, uh, safe cities for girls and women that is issued by the Vietnamese government to all 63 provinces in Vietnam. And the training curriculum for transit staff that we designed in the program um, had been adopted by the transportation sector in Hanoi. And so far, more, more than 1,800 transit staff in Hanoi, including bus driver, ticket collectors, have joined the training. And also the safe and friendly bus station model that design, designed by the youth themselves are being advocated for implementation by, by the government in Vietnam. And we will, in the coming time, we will continue to our work to make the city safer for girls. And we strongly believe that once girls feel safe in the cities, everyone will feel safe. And to end my presentation, I would like to invite you to watch a very short clip on how we introducing how we work with the school children to tackle around safety issues when using buses. Yes, Magic, can you help? Can you please help share the clip? We don't actually have that available, so we'll make sure that we can share it later on in the in the discussion, and um, we'll put the link in the chat for people to watch. Yep. Thank you very much, too, for a really great mm -hmm. overview. Um, and I think it's really um, great that you were able to present first here this morning, as, as we know today is the, the start of 16 days of action against domestic violence. And although this is not domestic violence per se, um, perhaps a precursor, some of these issues are precursors to domestic violence. Um, and so really great that you could highlight this on very, um, excited to see the key achievements you've been able to um, 
to achieve already. Um, and the fact that you include both boys and girls um, in this project, I think it's really important uh, that uh, boys learn um, and that through, you know, through the generation, you'll be able to, to change um, behaviors. So great. Um, anybody with comments directly to two, please pop these into the Q&A. Rebecca, do we have any burning questions? Um, we've got a couple of questions um, from Steve, just trying to understand the scale of the problem in the risk of girls as they journey to school. What's the prevalence or the incidence of violence or injury against young girls? And has that changed over time? So, two has the um, has the change? Um, what's the what's the situation yes. with violence? Yeah. Uh, yes, the the problem. Yes, I agree that the the uh, the the problem changed by time and time. And for in, within our framework of the project, we try to solve the issue of gender-based violence against girls in public places. Because in our in our survey to with the boys and uh, with the uh, with the girls, um, uh, in a few years ago, the the main problem that they face when they use public transportation is the sexual harassment. And out of the ten, um, out of ten girls, uh, there will be about five girls who have, uh, who have been sexual harassment on buses, and they really feel that. And I think that that is one of the big, big problem that they face, and they will, um, and that that hinder them from using public transportations. Yes, there are also and, uh, other. Yep. Sorry, go on. Uh, yes, there are also other other problems such as the, the quality of because you know in Vietnam the quality of the bus is not very good and also other such as the, the traffic jam or um, the traffic jam and also the quality of the of the services but the mod, the, the main thing is the sexual harassment. Yes. And how many with your champions for change you have both boys and girls how many of each have you recruited? And we have so far, we have about, about because we work with the school so far, we have worked um, uh, with about nearly 13 secondary school, high school and universities. And of the one or of 1,500, we have, you know, we have around, we have the equal number of boys and girls. We have around um, 750 boys and 750 girls because we work both with, boy, both with boys and girls to solve the gender-based violence issue because we cannot work with just girls themselves. Yep. And um, a question from Jagnor, um, what are the ethical challenges in working with young people on a very sensitive or stigmatized issue? Um, how, how, how how do they cope with that? Yeah. Uh, yes, in, uh, in in plan we um in plan we have a very strict system of child protection. So we do not work directly with the boys or the girls. We work through the governments. We work through the schools. For example, before we start the project, we go to work with uh, with the school to set up the project management team, and through um, the teachers and the um, the teachers in the school, we we support us. We so for example, we provide the training to the school facilitators who will then work with the boys and the girls themselves. And how, how responsive do you find the young men to be, the boys? Um, so it's, it's, I mean, clearly it's a very gendered issue. Um, it's, yeah, it's girls that are sensitive and, you know, it's good to work with young men and the boys. How do they respond to the training and the program? Yeah, at first we have a lot of difficulties because when talking about gender-based violence or gender equality, usually they would think that if the if the issues of girls and they have no, they have they have nothing to relate to that. But by through our communication campaign, through our training to them, they start to realize that they are. In many times, they are the problem for the issue. They are the they are the friend. They are the offender. Sometimes they witness even their, their friends, their sisters, their, their mother, or can also be the victims of the gender-based violence issue. So it's not, it's not the girls' issue, but it's everyone's issues. And they, they can be part of it to solve the issues. Okay, right. thank you so much. We might hand back over now, Mark. Thanks, Rebecca. And, and Anna has, has found the... the um little YouTube clip, so we'll play that now. Hopefully yeah. you can hear the sound. Nothing coming through sound-wise for me. 
Nope. No sound, Anna. Okay, Anna, I see you've put, um, or Fabian has put the, the link in the chat. I think maybe um, if people don't mind taking a look at the, the YouTube clip themselves um, after the, the presentation, the sound doesn't seem to be coming through. So I'm going to move on if you don't mind. Um, so the next person that we, we're going to hear from is Kush. From, uh, from India, who works for WRI in India. He trained as an architect um, and has a master's degree in urban planning. Um, and he's going to be telling us about the project um, that they're undertaking in the city of Rotec um, in India, um, which is a, a, a multi-pronged approach basically to improving mobility in the city. So it's over to you, Kush. Uh, thank you, Margi. I hope I'm audible. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to discuss this also. Uh, I was told to uh, share what we are doing, how we are approaching uh, this issue of improving mobility and roads uh, in Rotak. But I think uh, the way or the approach that WRI India is taking is only one of the many ways in which we can address this issue. And each uh, approach has its own uh, pros and cons. Uh, but I think uh, the more important story to be told is how we reached to a stage today where uh, we are able to implement uh, changes on ground. Uh, so, uh, this conversation uh, started back in 2013, uh, where we, uh, in the city of Gurgaon, Gurgaon is a, uh, is a metropolis next to the uh, capital, national capital of Delhi. Uh, this is the photograph of the Gurgaon city. Wow. It's a very uh, common site in the city. And when we look at this image, uh, you know, one can interpret this and uh, comment on this photographs in many different ways. Uh, when we used to talk to the government about improving mobility, and next please, uh, the government would uh, see this uh, image as, you know, the roads are not wide enough in the city to accommodate cars. And so basically we need to provide more roads. That was the narrative uh, of the, you know, the service provider. But when we as uh, mobility experts look at this uh, image, we see air pollution, we see inactive lifestyle, we see uh, potential road traffic accidents. And basically there is no space for the other road users to uh, you know, use, the, use the public space. Next. So uh, in 2013, uh, we started this uh, conversation uh, just to bring this uh, thing out that uh, on the roads, on the streets, uh, there are uh, not only the car users, uh, there are other road users as well that we need to cater uh, for. In fact, right now, uh, some of our colleagues are in Bhopal uh, doing a similar workshop. And I just uh, got to know uh, that Bhopal is a city of about uh, 2 million, I believe. And the number of car users in the city is just about 3%. And the entire city is uh, right now focusing on road infrastructure. There are flyovers coming up. Uh, there are so many road widening projects going on. Uh, but there are very few projects focused on uh, street vendors, uh, the cyclists, the uh, pedestrians. So we wanted to bring this forward uh, that there are other road users we need to cater. And it took us about uh, six months to start what we call is the Ragri Day, uh, which is a very similar event to uh, Car Free Days, where we close down a section of the street and for people to, you know, just hang out, uh, not use their cars, uh, experience a more healthy lifestyle. 
the first Rahagiri Day event was uh, organized on 17th November 2013. Uh, and till date, more than 14 million people have actually visited or participated in a Rahagiri Day event in more than 75 plus cities. We have had more than 3000 events so far. So this was the first conversation started uh, conversation starter where the governments started to realize that we are only catering to a very small percentage of road users there are other road users uh, there in the city on the streets that we need to cater to because before this conversation uh, every time we used to go uh, uh, and talk about improving mobility the question always used to come up was, uh, why do you want to close down streets for uh, uh, for pedestrians, for example, or NMT? We don't see any uh, pedestrians walking on the streets. Why do you want to make a footpath? So this Rahagiri uh, day, uh, you know, gave us the opportunity to showcase that there are other street users on the street. Next. Seeing the success of this uh, uh, Rahagiri day, uh, in 2017, we started the Haryana Vision Zero program. Uh, Haryana is the state uh, betting uh, the national capital of Delhi. Next. Uh, and we started this uh, program. Uh, it's a Vision Zero uh, based on the Sweden Vision Zero principle. We focus on, uh, you know, having safe systems, coordinated approach, uh, all those things. Uh, and so Haryana has 22 districts um, uh, and we started as a pilot with 10 districts. In 2018, looking at the success of the program, uh, we had uh, the chief minister of the state scale this program up to uh, the all the 22 districts of the state, basically. Now, uh, very uh, briefly, um, in the Haryana Vision Zero Pro so the Supreme Court of India has actually mandated that all the districts in India have a district road safety committee. In Haryana, before the Vision Zero started, the Haryana Vision Zero project started, uh, this district road safety committee was not meeting very frequently. If they were meeting, they were not really discussing on the real issues of road safety. Uh, what Vision Zero uh, brought to the table was this committee started meeting every month and they started, uh, you know, started talking about road safety in a coordinated way. How do we uh, resolve issues and everything? Then every month there used to be these two meetings, head of the department meetings, which had a representation from uh, head of all the engineering departments, all the, uh, you know, the police departments and so on and meeting with the district heads. So these are the three meetings uh, that used to happen every month at the state level uh, with all the stakeholders uh, together. So this was uh, one thing which created a very strong network uh, for us to reach out to uh, when we talk about urban mobility, when we talk about road safety. Uh, this, These meetings and uh, reaching out to these people uh, helped us in a way that all the pe key people, the people who have the authority to decide what is to be done and not done in a district, all those people are together in these uh, meetings. They are seeing what is being done in a different uh, jurisdiction. They are seeing what is working and what is not working. This helped us in scaling up uh, one is Ragiri in a way that the chief minister of the state said that all the districts are supposed to organize a Rahagiri day at least twice a month because they are seeing the benefits of the Rahagiri day. They also uh, requested all the districts to start the, you know, be more proactive in the Haryana Vision Zero program. And 2018 was around the time when we started the Botnar projects. Next. So Botnar project, uh, the first project that we did was a safer commute for school children. And right now we are doing the safer mobility for youth. Uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, network that we were able to build in Haryana Vision Zero, this basically helped us 
easily start the Botnet Child Road Safety Challenge projects in Rohtak because uh, the district administration in Rohtak at that time, they already knew the kind of work WR India was doing. Uh, they already knew the approach that we are taking to improve road safety and urban mobility. So it was very easy for us to convince them to now focus not only on general road safety, but also to start focusing on children, on youth, on also including these people, this target audience in these road safety conversations. So this is, I mean, there are a lot of activities that we are doing in these projects, but very briefly to uh, tell you that how we uh, basically included these target audiences in our projects was uh, when we when we design a street as an expert um, or I'm an adult and when I go and design a street, uh, it's by my experience, I am designing as an adult, uh, but I don't, I may or may not know how a child travels in a city, what are the challenges that child faces and what are his or her expectations out of the public space that he or she is in. So we, uh, in the first phase of the project, in the Safer Commute for School Children, we talked to more than 4,000 school-going children to understand how they are traveling in the city, what modes of transport they are using to reach their school, where else they are going apart from the school, uh, and their challenges and aspirations. Second thing that we did was uh, this tactical urbanism. Again, uh, using temporary, uh, uh, temporary installments to give proof of concept to the infrastructural changes that we are making. Uh, this was a very interesting uh, activity for uh, Rotak City uh, because you get a chance to recreate what you are, uh, a, you know, hard uh, infrastructure would require a lot of investment from the government and tactical urbanism provides them an opportunity to look at that uh, outcome of the hard investment um, before uh, investing so much. So this was uh, one key thing, innovative thing that we uh, looked into. And the third was including the children's voice and making this voice heard to the government. We did a couple of workshops uh, with the children. We gave them, uh, a, you know, a, a map of the road in front of the schools, and we asked them, how do they envision the street in front of their school? And it was very interesting to see that children were actually by themselves uh, drawing and communicating to us the things we actually keep proposing to the government that there should be a footpath, there should be trees on the, on the road, there should be less parking on the road. These are the things that the children uh, wanted on their streets. So we collected all those uh, sketches next, and we uh, shared it with the government as well. Uh, this is more or less phase one of the project. In the second phase, where we are uh, focusing on college-going youth, uh, the only difference being uh, school-going children are usually dropped by an adult. Uh, there is always an adult accompanying them when they are traveling. Uh, in the case of youth, in the case of college-going youth, they are newly independent uh, road users uh, who travel by their own vehicle uh, or or any other mode of transport, but they are now alone. Uh, so, so, so this is uh, the only difference in the two projects. What we have in, uh, added as a strategy in the second uh, phase is that we are engaging more youth in the conversation. We were not able to do that in, in case of children, school going children, but with college students, we are able to uh, have them more, uh, more part of the projects through tactical urbanism, through focus group discussions, having them uh, in our workshops with the officials. And we are also focusing on technological solutions. We recently completed a technology solution uh, challenge uh, there were three runner ups uh, there are very beautiful solutions coming from the students on how we can improve road safety and mobility in the city of rohtak it's as a pilot we are uh, implementing right now in rohtak if it is scalable we would like to go into other geographies as well 
basically our key learning in this whole journey has been that evidence based uh, solutions are the key to implementation just saying that we need a footpath for uh, street use uh, for people is not enough we need to provide the government with uh, information about how many users would use uh, a footpath what's the demand and so on so evidence based action works collaboration and partnership nan also emphasized on the need for shared responsibility not just the government civil society private sector community everyone is required so collaboration and partnership were a key in all these projects all these seven eight years support from all levels of government we can't go only top down or bottom up we need all levels of government uh, support from all levels of the government and the fourth point is what i have from my own personal experience realized that you know we just need to be patient and perseverant about what we are doing we just need to continually push that there are uh, times when you think that nothing is going on uh, nothing is getting implemented but sooner or later things do change uh, that was my presentation uh, Thank you very much, Chris. I think uh, a, a very good overview um, and, and important to understand that children are really not just little adults um, and so have different basic needs when they are moving around in traffic um, because of their stature, because of their knowledge, because of their impulsivity, etc. Um, the concept of uh, tactical urbanism may be something that's quite new um, to some of our colleagues who are on the call. So I've actually popped a blog that you and or one of your colleagues have written at WRI um, in India um, on tactical urbanism and how it's being used. Uh, so if people are interested in that, to please go there. Rebecca, any burning questions, recognizing that we need to leave some time for Sai to no, I think we can move on now. I think the only question was from Liz Towner about what was technical urbanism, and I think you've covered that. So we might just okay. move on to the next presentation. Okay, great. Thanks. So the last presentation comes from Simon, um, who's the country manager for AMEND in Tanzania. Um, Simon is trained uh, road safety advocate um, and has worked in, in the area of road safety for a long time. He's going to be telling us about um, the school area road safety assessment and improvement program. It's called SASE. Um, for short, um, and how that's being carried out in Tanzania as part of the, the Botna project. I think this uh, presentation speaks to a number of the aspects that uh, Nan brought up, not least of all reducing speed limits um, down to 30 kilometers an hour around schools. Sai, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Maggie, um, as you explained, uh, I work with AMEND, a non-government organization that delivers safe and healthy journeys and uh, improved environments in uh, a number of developing countries um, in, in the continent. And basically, we do scientific research, education campaigns, advocacy, pedestrian infrastructure improvements, particularly this project that I'm talking about now. And most of this work has fundamentally focused on children. Um, next, please. So um, in 2019, when we started working in Tanga, to, um, uh, which is a secondary city in Tanzania with a population of about 2.5 million, um, the situation was, was like this. And, and when we, when we um, spoke with um, members of the community, when we approached these schools, we approached local government to understand the the, the, the nature of incidents and the severity of, of, of incidents themselves, on average, you know, at every school that we uh, managed to go and speak with them, we could find at least two child RTIs, so road truck injuries, in the last uh, 12 months. What that means is these are those cases which were reported. And we know, you know, uh, having worked in this area, we know that there are a lot of unreported uh, cases that go undocumented and of course unlike uh, my colleagues what we found in Tanga majority of um, children 
primary school children from the age of five to 14 there walk to school. Primarily, that's the main mode of transport. And in that case, we have, you know, we, we, we saw that absence of uh, safe pedestrian infrastructure. That means no enough walkways, no enough, you know, pedestrian crossings and operating speeds for motorized vehicles was high. And, uh, and uh, to make matters worse is that majority of these vehicles are motorcycles. And in Tanzania and of course, a number of countries in the region now, we are seeing this spike of uh, motorcycles being the main mode of transport, significantly um, being used by majority of people in, in, in cities. And Tanga, of course, being one of those fast growing cities, that was the case. And uh, speaking about speeds, we found that 85th percentile of speeds was above 30 kilometers per hour. And in some cases, you have these motorcycles going up to 60 kilometers per hour, making it difficult for, for uh, uh, children and other road users to navigate through and cross these unsafe um, roads with less facilities for, 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 for safety. And, uh, and at the same time, misusing that space that is supposed to be used by pedestrians. Next slide, please. Um, so working together, and this, and uh, I should point out that uh, to implement SASA, which is um, a school area of safety assessment and improvement program, which has also been implemented in about 10 uh, countries in the continent, you know, talking of Lusaka, uh, Namibia, in Binduk and other cities where a similar situation was found and similar interventions were put in place and proven to make a significant difference in improving safety. We have worked closely and we keep on emphasizing on working closely with local government officials and local government uh, and uh, central government, you know, ministries, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Transport, uh, the traffic police, fundamentally, they have a big role to play and being that key partner, it helps in enforcing these measures that we put in place. At the same time, um, speaking with children themselves, my, you know, um, as, as we saw in India, it is extremely important to understand from the perspective of children themselves. Of course, they don't know a lot about the technical uh, solutions, but their input understanding the risk and showing us the specific locations where these issues are was important in um, proposing what measures should be put in place. And through this partnership, of course, uh, 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 community consultations being part of that, it is something that we, we found to be more sustainable and more um, impactful in a way that they own the project, they become part of that journey, they become part of that initiative, even when we are gone, they still um, 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 own the, 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 the initiatives and make sense of what has been put in place. And as you can see in the next slide there, please. Um, yes, so we can see the before and after situation whereby we don't have enough walkways, you know, we don't have uh, um, 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 uh, speed coming measures, rap rapid strips, and um, and speed humps, and then through that partnership with our team of engineers on the ground, we managed to put uh, these interventions in place. And um, having the local council, local department of engineering being fundamentally part of this process was very important because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are responsible for the maintenance of these particular interventions, right? And having them on board from the very beginning is extremely important because once the project has come to an end, they can still go back and repaint these zebra crossings. And when there are some major um, road projects taking place, they take note of uh, uh, interventions that, that we had put in place before. You know, if there was a hamp there, they know there's a reason why that hamp was put in place because of course the community was consulted and the officials were consulted as well. So um, it, it's, uh, it, it works well that way and I think we should 
emphasis put an emphasis on that that um, um, it is key to have these partnerships from the very beginning when the project just um, starts next please similarly as you can see on that slide we have um, 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 the before and after where children are crossing in very unsafe um, locations with motorcycles. And now the after interventions, as you can see, raised uh, to the specific crossing points, all of these in um, um, uh, facilitating that uh, and helping the children and other road users to safely uh, use that, um, the, 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 the safely walk from and um, out of school. And and if you look at the next slide as well, what we what we as you can see those interventions, you see um, slide number six, please. Yes, you see the motorcycles being one of the highest um, causes of those particular incidents. We had to be innovative, you know, innovative in a way that we had to stop motorcycles from encroaching the pedestrian space walkways that were designed for pedestrians and that helps in ensuring that space for pedestrians remains remained space for pedestrians and not being encroached by road users and now uh, slide number three is the impact so in after implementing this particular project between 19 uh, between 2019 and now what we have seen is that um, um, more importantly, we use these pilot projects to advocate for speed management agenda within the government. And fundamentally, we can highlight that the impact of these uh, interventions um, um, in regard to the actions of the second decade of action is that speeds are significantly reduced. There is high utilization of paved uh, footpath and zebra crossings by children. And then in all schools, six schools, uh, primary schools where we worked and the three secondary schools where we worked in Tanga between this period of time, there are no any road traffic injury that was rec uh, reported or recorded in the last uh, 12 months. I should say that's what I wanted to share with you from Tanzania, Tanga. Thank you so much and I'm open to further discussion. Thank you very much for that, Sai. Um, I think you were beginning to break up a little bit there at the end, so it's good that uh, we got to the end of your uh, presentation without too many, too many hiccups. Um, Rebecca, over to you for any additional questions. Thank you, Margie. Um, now I can't, I can't see any questions in the chat. So if anyone's got any, um, please post them. We don't have much. We don't have long now. Um, uh, we need to wrap up, but I mean, really, it was incredible um, uh, the, the differences there in some of those road infrastructure. The um, you know, really, when you see the, you can just visually see the the infrastructure difference. Um, how 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 did the community re respond to those? Um, what's the you know, and how do you measure that? Yes, interesting. So, as part of the. As part of the project, Rebecca, is that we do road safety education, tailored road safety education, where we go to schools and uh, members of the community along the project uh, areas to educate them, you know, to sensitize them about the importance of using these particular interventions. And the feedback has been very positive. Parents coming back and um, um, uh, hoping that they'll take even the younger ones, the younger ones to, to school in the, the coming years. That's a good response, you know, having those personal stories from parents and other members of the community. I think uh, that's the difference that the project uh, put in place. And as you can see, it's very visible for everyone to see the difference before if and after. That means, and, and the government takes a lot of credits for that, which for us, I think it's good in the long run, we find that it will be something that they will incorporate in the, uh, in the uh, projects uh, moving forward. Fabulous. Well, I think they're just about um, time to wrap up. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much to all of our wonderful speakers. It's just been really illuminating and wonderful to see the, um, you know, the brilliant innovations, the great research and community participation um, in this research, which we know is so critical to success. And, and really look forward to seeing a very successful second uh, road safety decade of action. Um, and we, we do know that, you know, action is required. And, and as Nan said, I think, 
remembering that we, you know, actually um, aligning work to the social uh, social uh, SDGs to the Sustainable Development Goals is going to be critical to achieving the road safety goals as well. So thank you, everyone. Um, just a reminder, um, we're running these seminars as part of the WHO Collaborating Centre in Injury Prevention and Trauma Care across the George Institute, and we host these um, seminars from uh, the George Institute Margie's um, in the UK and in Australia and with our School of Population Health at University of New South Wales in Australia. We will be running the next session. We're going to have a bit of a break over, I will say, summer because it's our summer here in Australia, <laughs> your winter, um, and come back on the 24th of February. So we look forward to all of you then. Um, and hopefully for that one, we will have some um, Australian research to present to you about some co-designed research that's in child injury that's being undertaken here. Um, uh, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are leading in Australia. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Margie. Um, thanks to all our speakers again, and we look forward to seeing you in a few months' time. Um, safe travels, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Happy thanks. holidays to those Bye. who are taking holidays. Bye. and Happy Thanksgiving to any Americans on the line. Um, <laughs> See you, you in Margie. February. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. So the recording will be up soon. Bye.